down here. Amen. Amen. So. It's, it's just been, for me and Melissa, I'll just say this has been the, the oddest move into a pastor that we've ever had because um, we already knew you and uh, you knew us and uh, we live in the town already. And we don't have to move to go to the next <laughs> church. And it's just a lot of good things. Amen. And so we're just really blessed to be here. And it's so good to, uh, to see all of you here this morning. Um, it's, uh, it's an honor for me to be your pastor. And, and I look forward to what God's going to do for, through, and to Emmanuel Baptist Church. And uh, let's, let's keep prayer our main focus, just pray, Amen. pray, pray, Amen. and see what God does. Mm -hmm. Now, some of you have asked, what you want? What do I want you to refer to me as, what title or any of that stuff? If you just want to call me Pastor David, that would be great. Amen. The doctor, you don't have to say that, that's not a thing for me. Um, Pastor David's fine, I know a lot of people in Michigan Short people's names, they call me Dave, but I just prefer David, so if you can remember that, that'd be great. Um, and as I mentioned, back when I preached my candidate sermon here, uh, I'm praying that God would lead me and us together to have a ministry that's Bible-centered, that's unashamedly Baptist, and that will build a fellowship among the church body. We need this. We need each other. And as we move forward, um, next Sunday, there's probably going to be a new order of worship. And uh, I've got ideas of things that I feel like the Lord has laid on my heart that we could do and try together as a church as we move into the future. And I'm, my plan is to introduce many of these very slowly over time. And... Some might be introduced a little quicker than others, but most just patiently. And so I'm going to ask you, if you will, just please give me grace and be flexible. I pray you'd be open-minded and be patient as well, because um, in my experience in working with churches, uh, if, if we keep on doing what we've always done, we'll keep on getting what we've always got. And I don't know that that's exactly the best thing. And what got us here isn't going to get us to where we need to be. So please just grant me some freedom and some latitude to make some changes and adjustments that could help us move forward as a church. Some things are going to work well. Some might not. I mean, I'll just be honest with you. Uh, and change is hard, you know, people don't like that. I don't like change either. It's not easy, and rarely do we uh, like it, but sometimes it's for the best. Um, again, I just want you to just pray for me, trust me, just um, be patient with me. Thanks for what you said, Pastor Rick, about um, the charge you gave to me and to the church. Um, and and I, I pray you'll be here. You'll participate in, as much as you're able to do that. And so, uh, again, thank you for calling me to be your pastor, and I look forward to getting to know you all better. And I really want to get to know you. I want to know you. I want to see where you live. I want to visit you in your home. I want to um, get to know who you are and where you've come from, what your story is. I want to know... Uh, what your interests are, where, what you think you might like to do in the church, how you might fit in, where your gifts can best be used. And, and I want to learn to not only know who you are, but how, how to love you and how to serve you better uh, as your pastor. So it's going to take some time. You all have known each other for a long time. And there's some people in here that know some people better than others. And I'm hoping that as we try to build fellowship, we can also build relationships with each other. So with that in mind, I'd like to just uh, 
have you to take your Bible, whether it's uh, in book form or electronically, whatever it is that you use these days. And uh, as my first sermon as pastor of Emmanuel Baptist Church, I'd like you to turn to Psalm 22. Psalm 22. Back in your Bible, you know, I know when I was growing up, they told me that Psalms is, is almost in the middle of your Bible. So when you, you know, open it up almost halfway, you're probably in Psalms. So if you find Job, it's just after that. If you get to Proverbs, it's just before that. So Psalm 22, as we look together at the Word of God. Some of you know that Psalm 22 is a psalm that prophesies Jesus, the Messiah's forsakenness and suffering on the cross because of our sins. It's a messianic psalm. It's prophetic. It foresees and foreshadows what's to come. David is experiencing some things in his life personally, and the words that he ends up using end up being prophetic in the some of the very words and thoughts that our Lord Jesus is going to say when he gets to the cross. And so Jesus prophetically is pictured in Psalm 22 as the Lamb of God taking away the sins of the world, more particularly taking away the sins of everyone in the world who would believe in him. And so let's look at Psalm 22. Let's start in the first two verses in Psalm 22. It says here, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from helping me and from the words of my groaning? Oh, my God, I cry in the daytime, but you do not hear. And in the night season, and am not silent. You know, just in these first two verses, you can see that the psalmist David here, he is hurting. He feels isolated. He feels alone and like his back is up against a wall. And to him, defeat is certain unless the Lord intervenes. And so he's crying out to the Lord for help. Have you ever felt like that in your life? Have you ever felt helpless, maybe hopeless, like you were at the end of yourself and all that was left was God? And if God didn't come through, you were done for. I mean, I don't know if you've ever been there. Or maybe not just you personally, but as a member of this church or a regular attendee of this church, you felt similarly maybe about this church. Like, I don't know how much longer we can hang on. Or I'm not sure how much longer we can last. What, what can we do? Is the Lord finished with us here? Maybe some of you have wondered those things and thought about it. So, too, David wondered if this was it for him, if it was over for him. Well, let's keep reading verses 3, 4, and 5. It says here, But you are holy, enthroned in the praises of Israel. Our fathers trusted in you. They trusted and you delivered them. They cried to you and were delivered. They trusted in you and were not ashamed. So David is reminding God in his prayer that, Lord, you've done it before. You've rescued your people. You've delivered them from destruction. Lord, will you do that again? And, and I assume that, that you all, many of you, have been praying long and hard that the Lord would show you the way forward as a church. That the Lord would provide for your needs as a church. That he might take this shell of what Emmanuel once was and breathe new life and vitality into it and be greatly used by him again. Maybe you pray things like, Lord, deliver us. Help us. Show us the way, Lord. Very similar, I think, to what David here in Psalm 22 is praying. Well, let's continue reading, beginning in verse 6. But I am a worm and no man, a reproach of men, and despised 
by the people. All those who see me and ridicule me, they shoot out the lip, they shake the head, saying, He trusted in the Lord, let him rescue him. Let him deliver him, since he delights in him. But you are he who took me out of the womb. You made me trust while on my mother's breast. I was cast upon you from birth, from my mother's womb. You have been my God, but be not far from me. For trouble is near, but there's none to help. Many bulls have sur surrounded me. Strong bulls of Bashan have encircled me. They gape at me with their mouths like a raging and roaring lion. I am poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax that has melted within me. My strength is dried up like a potsherd, and my tongue clings to my jaws. You have brought me to the dust of death. For dogs have surrounded me. The congregation of the wicked has enclosed me. They pierced my hands and my feet. I can count all my bones. They look and stare at me. They divide my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. But you, O oh Lord, do not be far from me. O oh, my strength, hasten to help me. Deliver me from the, from the sword. My precious life from the power of the dog. Save me from the lion's mouth and from the horns of the wild oxen. You have answered me. I'm not sure how that last statement, you have answered me, appears in your Bible. In mine, it's, it's separated a little bit at the end of verse 21 from the rest of it. But it's interesting. David's praying. He's desperate. He feels like his back is against the wall, and he's not sure what's going to happen. God, are you going to do something? Are you going to come through? And then... At the end of verse 21, he says these words, you have answered me. And, and when we get to read the rest of Psalm 22, we're going to see that David does not talk about how God rescued him as he had been praying in the verses we read up to this point. It's like God in his answer to David's prayer for deliverance said, you're focusing on the wrong thing, David. Don't focus on deliverance. Focus on the deliverer. Get your mind set upon me and my kingdom and my word and off of the things that are causing you fear and doubt. Y'all know the hymn, Turn Your Eyes Upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. And the things of this earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. I like that hymn. I, it's, it, it reminds me to keep my focus on the Lord. And perhaps God is telling Emmanuel Baptist Church today, stop focusing on revival and revitalization and instead focus on the reviver and the revitalizer, Jesus the head of the church. He is not the means to the end that you want for this church. He is the end. He is all we need. Amen. We need him and we want to magnify the Lord Jesus. We want to lift him up and exalt him and his name, the name above every name. The Bible says the only name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. There is no other name. There is no other Savior. And in the Bible, God tells this world that it is in the mess it is in today and has been because it's looking for answers outside of what he has already provided through his son, Amen. Jesus. Religion, faith, Christianity, or anything related is the last thing a lot of people want to consider as true, legitimate, and the solution to their problems. And so, they keep on looking to everything else but God who made them. The God who gave us a book that tells us what is right and wrong, mm -hmm. what is good and bad, 
what is true and false, what is real and imaginary, what is beautiful and what is hideous, and who tells us that the way back to God, the way back to peace, the way to have purpose and wholeness is through repenting of the sin that has caused this problem and turning in faith and trusting the Lord Jesus Christ, following and obeying Him. Amen. That's the solution to the world's problems. Amen. Nothing else will do. So look here. As we continue in Psalm 22, David has just said, You have answered me. Now he says in verse 22, I will declare your name to my brethren. In the midst of the assembly, I will praise you. You who fear the Lord, praise him. All you descendants of Jacob, glorify him. And fear him, all you offspring of Israel. For he has not despised nor abhorred the affliction of the afflicted. Nor has he hidden his face from him. But when he cried to him, he heard. My praise shall be of you in the great assembly. I will pay my vows before those who fear him. The poor shall eat and be satisfied. Those who seek him will praise the Lord. Let your heart live forever. All the ends of the world shall remember and turn to the Lord. And all the families of the nations shall worship before you. For the kingdom is the Lord's and he rules over the nations. All the prosperous of the earth shall eat and worship. All those who go down to the dust shall bow before him, even he who cannot keep himself alive. A posterity shall serve him. It will be recounted of the Lord to the next generation. They will come and declare his righteousness to a people who will be born. That he has done this. Amen. Notice again how David stopped focusing on the problems around him and immediately began focusing on the adequacy, the sufficiency, and the reliability of God. Once David shifted his thinking, once he sought God first, once he stopped complaining and started praising God, he began to see things as they really were in truth. Again, David did not say at the end of verse 21, you have rescued me. He said, you have answered me. It's like David remembered that God made promises to his people that he would never leave them nor forsake them. Mm -hmm. And even when they feel like he is far from them, he is not. He is near to all who call upon his name. David seems to have just suddenly remembered God's promises to Israel and that you can always trust God to keep his word. It might not be in the timing and in the situation that you would choose, but it's certainly the best and right timing as far as God is concerned, and he's much smarter than any of us. Amen? Amen? So the next time you're down, the next time you're defeated, discouraged, and in the dumps, look up to God. Amen. Try and focus on him and get your eyes off your problems and on to him, the, the problem solver. The more you see God, for who he truly is, the more your problems will be put into perspective. And you'll see them for what they truly are. So we need to, to get into God's word and get God's word into us so that we can better see things the way he sees them. It might not line up with what the world thinks is real and true, and that's okay. It's what God thinks and says about something that matters. So Psalm 22 is a psalm of David that moves from what appears to be disorientation and defeat to reorientation and victory. From the anguish of forsakenness to a place of praise and optimism. 
Confusion becomes clarity. Uncertainty turns into certainty. And here in Psalm 22, Jesus is the sacrificial lamb that's foreshadowed. And when we get to Psalm 23, he's the good shepherd. The green pastures and the peaceful, refreshing, still waters that he promises in Psalm 23 are possible because of his suffering in Psalm 22. The forsakenness that we have in Psalm 22 is replaced by, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, thou art with me. So let's read Psalm 23. Probably no one in here has never heard it. But either way, we're going to read it again. Let's try to read it maybe as if we've never seen it before. That's kind of hard, but we'll try. Psalm 23, a Psalm of David. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runs over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Amen. Isn't that good? Amen. I love that. The dryness and the dust and the thirst of Psalm 22 are replaced by the peaceful streams and refreshing waters of Psalm 23. So listen, when you go through times of disorientation and uncertainty and adversity and struggle, I want you to understand that it has a purpose. There's a purpose in it. God doesn't waste anything. He is such a mighty God that he can take tragedy and bring good from it. And what some mean for evil, God can turn to good. In fact, many of you right now probably are thinking of Romans 8, 28. That verse says that we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are the called according to his purpose. Now that's a great verse, but I want you to understand what it does not say. It does not say that we know that all things are good because we know that all things aren't good. There's a lot of bad, there's a lot of evil and terrible things that happen in this world. But it does say that all things work together for good and it doesn't say to everyone without exception. It says to those who love God. God has a way of, of turning bad situations and redeeming them and bringing good out of them for those who love God. And who, who is that exactly? Well, the rest of Romans 8, 28 says it, who it is. It's those who are the called according to his purpose. And so I'm glad we serve a God like that who is not frustrated and whose hands are tied when something bad happens in the world. No, we have hope. We have help. We have a God who loves us and who's going to bring good to us even in the midst of bad times. And you know what? Our neighbors need to hear that. Our community, this, these neighbors around us, they need to hear a message of hope, of peace, and of reconciliation. And let us be the people, like in the end of Psalm 22, the people who praise God, the people who share the hope of the gospel in the midst of our struggle like David did. 
then maybe God will use our praise to ignite a gospel movement where many turn to God through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Give God the glory and the fog through the disappointment, through the pain, in the adversity, because you know what? There's a better place ahead. Psalm 22 begins with God's silence. But silence does not mean absence. God is always near, even when you don't perceive it. God will not forsake you. If you are his child, he has promised, he will always be with you, even to the end of this age. He will never leave you nor forsake you. And Psalm 22 is not about deliverance from death although you might think it is. It is about deliverance through death. Jesus died so you can live. Jesus died so this church can live. Amen. So the gospel takes people to a better place. Bad news becomes good news. Our sin was dealt with in the death of Christ on the cross. We can be forgiven and have peace with God through the cross. Death becomes life. Jesus died for us so that we might live for him. Amen. We were dead in trespasses and sins, but God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, made us alive together with Christ that he might show the riches of his grace and his kindness towards us. For by grace are you saved through faith, and, not, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God planned from the beginning that we should do. So all of what I'm sharing with you today rests in the truth, in the fact and in the reality that Christ arose from the dead according to the scriptures. That he conquered death, he conquered sin, and all who trust in and follow him already have conquered death because Christ is their life. He paid it all. He did it for you, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God. The Bible says that sin no longer has dominion over us, because we have been freed from sin are now, and are now slaves to God through our Lord Jesus Christ. This means we will live forever because Christ is our life. He is in us and we're in him. So friends, listen, Jesus is enough. He's paid it all. His divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness. His spirit dwells within us and we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. Let us lift our eyes unto the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth, in whom we have life, the one who has the words of eternal life, Jesus himself. And as we finish up today, right here this morning, as we finish up, we are really just getting started. I believe God is going to do great things through all of us. And so let's get excited like David did in that second half of Psalm 22 when he realized, wait a minute, I'm focusing on the wrong things. I've got to focus on God and how great and glorious and wonderful and helpful and hopeful he is. Let's truly be people of faith. And so as we wrap it up here, this part of the service, I want to challenge you to do one thing this week. Just one thing. Invite someone to church next Sunday. That's it. You think you can do that? I mean, just one person. Invite them. If they don't come, that's not your fault. But you, you put it out there. You invited them. You asked them. Tell them, hey, we got a new pastor at the church. Come meet him. Come here and or tell them, hey, you know, you're welcome to sit with me. You know, if you don't know anyone else or whatever, you can come and sit with me. 
You can tell them we're not going to ask them for money. I mean, we'll take it if they want to give. <laughs> but uh, we're not going to ask them. We're not going to. We're not going to call them out or make them, you know, stand up or stand out. We're not going to try to embarrass anybody in any way. But do that. Invite someone to church next Sunday. And uh, let's see. Maybe we'll have a few more in here next week. Uh, so, if you desire to follow Christ, who we've been learning about and talking about this morning, if you desire to follow him and be saved, we're going to sing a hymn in just a minute. It's the one that Rick actually sang during the offering. All I have is Christ. Um, and during this last hymn, if, if you want to come and see me and tell me about um, your desire to be saved, I would love to hear that from you and talk with you about that. Maybe there's others here who this morning need to pray and just need to confess. Lord, I've been doubting. I haven't been believing. I want to be like David. I want to, I just want to trust you more. Uh, maybe, maybe you're already saved, but you're just not walking as close to God as, you know, he wants you to. Uh, and if you'd like to come up front and kneel and pray, you're welcome to do that. I mean, you can do it right where you are. I'm not saying that moving from one place to another actually has any, you know, uh, redeeming value, but it could. It could help you. Um, so just do what God's telling you to do this morning. Don't harden your heart. Don't, don't put God off. Because then it's easier the next time to say, no, no, Lord, I don't, I don't want to do that. Or maybe there's someone else here that desires to join the church and work with us to reach this community with the gospel. In fact, I need to join the church today. So, my wife and I, we're, we're going to be joining the church this morning. So, um, but whatever God's telling you to do, you do that. So let's pray, and then after that, we'll close with all I have is Christ. Father, thank you for bringing us here. Thank you for your word. Thank you for... Just the honesty of your word and how David was just crying out. His back was against the wall. He felt hopeless, helpless. He wasn't sure if you were going to come through. And then, Lord, you answered him. You didn't rescue him at that moment, but you did answer him. And you, you, you helped him change his focus off of his problems and onto you. Lord, help us do that. And Lord, um, as we've already mentioned, you are the Savior, the, the only one there is, the only way to be saved is through faith in Jesus Christ. And so, Lord, if there's anyone here this morning who desires to be saved and, and would like to, uh, to, to, to be prayed for and counseled in that way, Lord, I pray that they would make that known either during service.